brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village at Britain, the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. All right, guys. Well, I think we're ready to start. If anybody else is going to be joining us, they're going to have to be joining us a little bit late. So we are on our actual episode 40. And as you remember, last couple of episodes, we have done the prehistory of Australia and the early peopling of Australia. We talked a little bit about the different um, peoples who came to Australia early on and how the dingo got there and all that other lovely stuff. And we also had an episode on the Black War and the Tasmanian Aborigines uh, separately because I felt that that topic did deserve a separate discussion. And today uh, we have a special guest speaker. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Um, Paul is, go is somebody who is experienced um, and who has uh, lived among, from one as then lived among and had personal experience with the Aborigines peoples who is, um, very familiar with their culture, and I hope that Paul is going to be able to share with us his knowledge from more of an insider point of view about um, the Aborigine culture, worldview, um, you know, beliefs, and everything like that. So, Paul, I'm going to let you go ahead and take over from here. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Okay, I thought I'd give you, introduce you to some of the language and just sing a song. Um, and also do what we call in the culture uh, a land acknowledgement. And I've noticed that actually happening throughout America. It's been practiced in Australia for uh, at least 20 years or more, and where you acknowledge the land that you're on. So, right here, um, I'm in Laramie, Wyoming, and I acknowledge. Uh, that this land is part of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Shoshone, Lakota, and all the first peoples who shared this landscape. And we honor and respect the elders past, present, and emerging. And uh, this is an Aboriginal song that brings happiness to the land. It's called a Wonga song with the cap sticks that were given to the people in the dream time. And the didgeridoo would be played normally with this and there'd be a song and dance and it's, uh, it's a male and female song, it's a group song. And happiness to the land is not a nirvana thing, it's actually practicing ecology where they would sing the land to make sure they get the right balance on the land that they get the right amount of rain. If the right amount of rain happens, then um, all the children, all the mothers will have healthy children, the plants, the birds, the animals, the insects, everything, and the people we kept in balance. <laughs> They nalariane, they nalinde, they nalariane, they nalariane, they nalinde, they nalariane, they nalinde, they nalariane, they so the land acknowledgement is a practice where you're actually practicing respect. And this goes back to the, to the core story, the creation story. Everything is linked to the creation story. So I want to introduce this. Can you all see this website here? Yes. This is called Yubal Yawan Dreaming Project. And this is 30 years of dedicated work with this man, Idam Duma, which is the sound of thunder. Um, if you think of thunder, from hearing it from a distance, and that's very much part of the Aboriginal language system is to name the birds after the sound that they make, listening to nature, because that's teaching us. So everything comes from the landscape. The land is the key. And you're going to hear me say this over and over and over again. 
and uh, the land. It's called caring for country. So here we have, there's a lot of the sort of administrative stuff, stuff up here. You can explore. This is a resource that was paid for by American Philanthropy. And my journey with Bill goes back 30,000, uh, 30, 30 years uh, of basically listening to him and following him around and with his permission this is all down here you see uh 10 video chapters which could be the basis of a teaching course and this is for the public and this is with bill's permission he he really wants to share his wisdom with the rest of the world and my role here i'm a white fella as they say we say in australia white fella black fella and that's not seen as disrespectful that's just the way it is so you often hear a white fella way of thinking black fella way of thinking and that would be a western uh way of thinking as opposed to an aboriginal uh, non-western way of thinking and bill never went to school and he grew up in what we call the bush uh -huh. and he grew up in the full ceremonial tradition so i'm going to go take you into one of these chapters here we're going to look at the languages this shows the the amazing diversity okay of the culture here's your language map and i'm going to click on it and here you have 250 language groups and you have 600 to 700 distinct dialects which in the aboriginal culture that's in our indigenous culture that's a distinct language in itself or a distinct culture culture group in itself so it's almost like in this country where I am, if I said, uh, you have a language group, Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota. In Bill's country up here, he's up in here. You have Waterman, Yongman, and Wagaman. There's three language groups that are pretty close to each other. But if you go up, if you go up to a, a Lakota, person and you say are you nakota no they'll say i am lakota and i have lakota friends same with the watermen they see themselves it's all to do with your again your landscape celebrating your landscape so bill grew up in this land so there's probably in this landscape there's probably three million acres he's managed to get a million acres back so he's back on his land after it was taken away and this is his his personal story and what i can share with you is his personal story as a way as a gateway of trying to understand uh 700 distinct stories here that's what's really hard and um you know having permission is really important in the culture particularly me as a white fellow i'm english irish german welsh and so i'm doing this with respect uh, for the cultural tradition and with permission from Bill. Paul, let me, let me ask you, where are you from? Uh, do, do you reside here in, in the United States and Australia? And where, where are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm from down here. All right. In Adelaide. In Adelaide. All right. In the Ghana country. I got so you. So if I was in Adelaide, I would say um, right now, I would say I honor and respect the Ghana people. I got you. Right. And recognize this is an Aboriginal practice of recognizing. Um, the culture is practicing respect because there is a legal jurisdiction when you move into somebody else's country. So as Bill moves around, if he wanted to sing his song in Ghana country, he'd have to ask permission from the elders down there. And this is this was a peacemaking thing that actually created relative peace right across the country for fifty thousand years. And fifty thousand years is a really difficult concept but 50,000 years of attachment to a single piece of land imagine the intimacy so <clears throat> i've been visiting bill for 30 30 years and when i'm when we're traveling through the, the land he has a story has a creation story and a song that goes with every piece of landform and it could be one tree in the savannah bush that he'll stop and tell a story if it's unique uh, it will be part of a creation story. And this intimacy is pretty remarkable. And it could be a little rock formation, or it could be certainly a big rock formation, but every, every natural landform has a, a story. So this is a, 
a connection to country which teaches caring and they would practice through ritual through song dance painting they'd paint themselves up and these were all rituals that were passed on from the dream time from the creation time and aboriginal people still to this day are practicing these ceremonies they have changed and they have uh, depending on the contact and whatever, and the individual story for all over, all over Australia, um, they're still doing ceremonies and they may, might have changed or they may be lessened in some way in terms of time factor, but it doesn't mean that the culture's lost. The culture has not stopped. And right. that's important. The culture is still alive and it is still being practised and Aboriginal people are not dying out. And that's a very important message they want to leave with the rest of the world, that we are strong and flourishing and they are the most resilient in the world. Now, yeah. may I ask you a question real quick um, yeah. regarding, regarding, because I know that uh, there was obviously a significant impact when there was a serious and uh, basically invasion by the Europeans of the Australian continent. Is there any estimate uh, to the losses of cultures and languages uh, versus those ones that remain today and are strong? Yes, and I think if you go back to that, uh, where were we? On this page, I think, up here. This is a resource, mm -hmm. 170 language groups, 500, 600 dialects, and the scientists argue about this. 145 Aboriginal languages are spoken today, and of these, uh, considered about, about only 18 languages remain strong. And this is changing. In that area where Bill is, there are 30 languages uh, that are red lighted. And there's only, Bill represents one of uh, three language speakers left. So you've got these small oh, wow. diverse groups and that makes them very vulnerable. Right. If you go to the New Zealand and the Maori culture, which is relatively a lot younger, right. they have been able to successfully uh, um, amalgamate around one language. Right. And, that, right, and that's given them a lot of cultural strength to do so. How do the language groups line up as a, as in family and and historical or prehistoric language dispersal? So if you if you look at this map, you can see the red line areas that would be a geographic thing. So the land creates the culture. Mm -hmm. We always go back to the landscape. So the geography. In the, this would be a language uh, grouping down here, up here, and this is supposedly was the the entry point right up here, as you would have probably studied. But if you go down here to Western Australia, this is a totally different language system right down here, which is quite remarkable. And it's remarkable. The interesting thing that right across Australia is Aboriginal people had a spiritual, legal, constitutional system called the dreaming which links them still to this day even though you've got this 50,000 years and probably because of that 50,000 years the linkage is there but you've got that diversity of languages right across Australia that are totally different but there are practices built within the details vary and the details aren't important it's really a celebration of your land where you are but the essence the dreaming essence and that's what I want to leave with you today is a feeling of how Aboriginal people really their worldview, and this still goes on today, right. how they see the world, how they see everything connected, and how they're important. Uh, their voice is really important for what's happening with the planet right now. Does that answer your question, sort of? It it does. Uh... It's. I, I think. I think with you approaching it a little bit more from a holistic point of view, rather than kind of a strictly if my understanding is correct, from strictly anthropological, a kind of linguistic and uh, geographic. Um, yeah, and I'm not an anthropologist or uh, I'm, my background actually was in social work. I, I met Bill in the 80s as a social worker and uh, I was just interested and I hung out with him. I kept coming back year after year after year and then it turned into a mentorship when I came to, a, and I live in America right now, I came over as an ambassador and I had to, whether I liked it or not, I had a didgeridoo on my shoulder and I had to answer questions of culture. So I went back to Bill and he said, they're asking me, Bill, uh, Paul, they're asking me, Bill, about the dreaming, the dream time, 
uh, the rainbow serpent, what, what's all this all about? And he said, well, you better teach him. So sure. then we started an active mentorship, which is very rare. When I grew up in Adelaide, I did not have contact with Aboriginal people growing up. Right. So tell us a little bit more about the dream time. What is it? Like, what is it? Is it a concept? Is it an idea? What, 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 a lot of people are not familiar with it whatsoever. Right. So the dream time is the creation time. In the creation time, the, the great spiritual ancestors came from the sky. They came out of the ground. They came out of the ocean. In the beginning, there was no trees, no land, no rocks. There was no shape to the land. There was no life. The spiritual ancestors came first. Rainbow, in particular, began to carve out the river systems with his mighty sweeps of his tail. He did the folding and the shaping of the landscape. He did the geology of the land, but he also brought the water. And he, she, it's a multi concept and it's a, one of the major spiritual ancestors you will see uh, particularly across the north if you go to the north of australia you will see pictures on the side of buses you see this giant snake with multi colors that's the rainbow snake the rainbow serpent who can bring the flood bring the drought but brings the the water that we need as well um in bill's country you have a sky father who's a long tall skinny fella and he's the boss of the sky. And you also have an earth mother called Dung Dung. And she is a frog lady. She gets her, her name after the sound that she makes. And they are the three, they actually have the three, three ancestors. But as you go around Australia, you have these different uh, spiritual ancestors. It's almost like the spiritual took on different um, aspects. They took on different costumes depending on that landscape. And that's okay. Aboriginal people have a, a story of the origin of the kangaroo. All over you'll have 700 different stories of the origin of the kangaroo which relates to their land. They didn't go around and say, well, my story's right and yours is wrong. Oh, yours is wrong. They're all okay. Everything's okay. And that's a beautiful concept that everything is, is no worries, mate. As we've learned in our vernacular, that actually comes from Aboriginal wisdom that was taught to the white fellas when they arrived. So the ancestors came, they shaped and they were singing. They gave birth to the people and they passed the songs and the dances and the ceremonies, the paintings onto the people still to this day. And the songs, the ceremonies teach the people to care for your land. They call it caring for country. And this was then what they call the legal, the law, L-A-W. It's not L-O-R-E, it's L-A-W. This is their legal system that they practice. So you practice your law is caring for your country and that's how you keep it in balance. You keep your ecological balance by doing the ceremonies, right? Right. Then the people went through, they then continued the shaping and there's a point, there's a major point in the, all the creation stories where the spirituals became what we know to this day. So some of the people walking around became the kangaroos, right? Some became that emu, the giant one who could run really fast. They became the birds or the kookaburras or the cockatoos. Yeah, yeah. Some jumped into the billabongs, which are the springs to become the crocodiles and the fishes. Some became rooted in the ground to become the trees. Some change into the insects, like the grasshoppers, which is Bill's principal totem. We'll talk about totems later, okay? And then some people change into the present day people, which is us. And the job of the present day people is to look after all your relatives in the natural world, because we all come from the same beginning. Right. The same essence. This is microbiology. Right. My molecular structure is, is is very much the same as the plant, the bird, the animal, the insect. So the scientists have shown that all the building blocks of matter are all connected. So the dreaming comes through. They call it the dreaming now because it's in, in it's in every living thing. The dream time is in every living thing, which is that spiritual energy essence so this links to cutting edge science in the big bang because energy came first before the stars were made and then they would then say that's where matter came and our bodies are made from stardust so there you go so then the at the same time this is where they link to the stars in the creation story when everything changed to become bill calls it when it 
came to still, which it was all moving and whatever, and it came to still. He describes it as a sort of muddy period. And then all the shadows, when everything changed on the land, the shadows of all the people went up into the sky to become the stars. And the major spirituals, which is rainbow, and in Bill's country and the, the sky father and the earth mother, they all went up into the dark spaces in the Milky Way, which is right behind me. Yeah. Right. They focus on the dark matter, which is where science is focused now, caught in the black holes, where creation started. That's where the creators live in the Aboriginal wisdom. And they're looking down from above. They're seeing if, how we're carrying out the law. The law is caring for country. And if we don't care for our country, they give us a signal. And it could be the tidal wave, the volcanic eruption, the bushfire, which is happening in Boulder right now. Right. Close to Florida Superior is burning up. 500 houses are burnt, have burned today. Um, this, is a, this is a clear uh, indication from the, Bill would say, from the spirituals saying, pay attention. You're not caring for your country. So this is where the wisdom is incredibly relevant right now. And that's what this website is all about, is giving um, authentic voice to the indigenous. And I'll, we're going to listen to Bill in a minute instead of me. Right. Um, does, how does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Right and, could you, and could you share a little bit about the rainbow serpent and the, the significance of this figure? So rainbow, rainbow is major, and certainly in Bill's country, um, up here in this in this tropical, this is a tropical. You get monsoonal rains, so you see uh, a lot of stories about rainbow in this country, and this is where the didgeridoo, rainbow um, made the rivers. He actually made the ocean. He made the rivers. He brought water, essentially brought water to the world, and uh, in Bill's creation story. He uh, took the sound of the running water and he gave it to the termites, who were people in the beginning. And then they, in their time, in the creation time, they ate through the trunk of the eucalyptus tree and they put that song in the tree. And when you blow that didgeridoo, that's the sound of the running water. So the didgeridoo, playing the didgeridoo, and I do arts and education, don't teach didgeridoo to kids. And right. say, this is gonna fill you, help to fill your rivers in your community wherever you are. Rainbow teaches us to pay attention for the land. When Rainbow uh, brought the laws about caring for the water, he went to rest in, this is another story, went to rest in the billabong, which is a pond, and people watched and they waited. And then one day another big storm came, Rainbow shut up through the trees, through the clouds, and he dove into another spring many miles away and still to this day when people see the rainbow in the sky they say that's the rainbow snake jumping from one billabong to another billabong one pot of gold to another pot of gold which would be my irish heritage and the pot of gold is water and the lesson is when you see that you remember that story and that's a reminder don't be greedy with the water always share the water right, right? rainbow teaches us water ethics okay and the importance of water so um, there are many, and right across all these different groups that would incorporate Rainbow into that Rainbow Snake into a lot of these stories. And he was connected to the didgeridoo as well. So, uh, so the Rainbow is a positive uh, event or positive, I guess, natural phenomenon in the, in the Aboriginal culture, because I know that about half of the world cultures view uh, the rainbow as a very positive uh, phenomenon, and about half of the world cultures view it as a negative one. So this is definitely yeah. the case when it's, it's a positive one. It's a, it's a serpent. So right. it's, it's, right. It's, it, it can kill you. It's the flood, it's the drought, and it's also the water. So it's the okay. will of the everything, pretty much, right? It's, it's, it's major. Rainbows are really... If there was a mysterious character, it would be Rainbow. So the snake in general, like not the, not the rain, ray, uh, Rainbow Serpent, but the snake in general, is that a positive character in the Aboriginal culture? Is that a negative one? I think it teaches respect. It's something that you, you uh, Rainbow, you, you respect, but you also, there's, there's fear with Rainbow. You don't mess with Rainbow. Right. 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 
Does it have healing? Does it have any? Does it um, have any healing um, powers? Does is it something that you would appeal to, or something that you would reach out to for? I don't know, dealing with uh, situations of illness and so forth. Well, I've I've witnessed the Aboriginal elders uh, take the didgeridoo, play it right into the heart chakra. Mm. For um, for healing, they would pick somebody out in the group. I got you. I got you. So it's, it has a major. Yeah, there's healing. Everything in the Aboriginal, it's all connected. Um, I've got a whole bunch. There's 50 teaching clips on here. And it's not me. This is Bill Harney, and it's all translated. So he's a person who, ne who never went to a Western school. His English is probably his third language. So he can speak seven languages. So he's a master linguist. He's the most intelligent person I know. But his, the, the Indigenous my his indigenous education he calls himself the bush professor mm. the emeritus professor of his culture and he um uses the uses his intelligence it's different intelligences so it's, he's a really a wonderful um gateway into uh the old past the ancient past fifty thousand years and i want to just say something about go ahead this black area here, that's 200, that's about two, two or three inches. That's 200 years when my ancestors arrived in Australia. So this is a little timeline. Can you hold and it vertically? Because I think there's something on your screen that's, yeah, there we go. Now we can see it. I say something. Okay, and then Columbus arrives 500 years ago in America. And then we go to a thousand years, okay? And then we go to another, next thousand years and we have the birth and death of christ okay so you take this piece of rope which is now two feet long and you go it'll take you right out into my street for right. fifty thousand years so fifty thousand years of knowledge compared to the beginnings of my ancestry and then you've got your European ancestry in North America. When you get to about 20,000, you get to into American Indian culture. And just for that simple reason, you look at 20,000 compared to Columbus. Those stories are the history of this landscape. You know, that's our history. So they really need to be told and respected. And there are metaphors uh, in those stories that are really you, uh, by telling them over and over again, you really get to know that culture. Anyway, this, I just want to give you an idea of that 50,000 years. So imagine 50,000 years connection to one piece of land. So when I'm on Bill's country, he knows where every spring is. It's right. all in his mind. So it's amazing sense of security. And when I was a social worker, 21, hanging out with Aboriginal people, there was a joy and a sense of security that was different to me growing up in the suburbs of Adelaide with a happy Catholic family. Right. And it was, a, it was just, it kept me coming back for 30 years and I'm still learning. So we're, so, dealing with some, we're dealing with some really old stuff. Right. So I, I've, I've, re, I've even read a study, I think it was either last year or the year before last, where they found out that some of the Aborigine Dreamtime stories actually reflect some uh, geological uh, events that took place thousands and thousands of years ago. And uh, they were able to actually kind of uh, correlate some of the Dreamtime stories to the actual um, the kind of really serious Titanic events uh, disappearing and appearing of land masses yep. and so forth. And that's exactly what the creation story is that I'm going to share with you. Okay, let's listen to Bill. And I've grown up in the bush in my, all my life. I work in my own land. But I work also in a different parts of the area. But I've always come back to the homeland. In the landscape where you travel through, in open area, the area begins in some blood plain or little high mount, which is sacred. The sacred area means which is created by somebody 
back from the dream time. The river itself, uh, many sacred places there, right? You know, you know the waterfall and all this, but that was put in there back in the creation time. Part of the creation story, song and everything in it there, all in the river. And everything to recognize who the daughter of mother. For many other clan groups coming together from mother's side, from uh, grandfather, whatever, you know, and all this, so everybody recognize one another. We share that water together. That's what we're doing. This is a teaching from the word of mouth. What we teach is a ceremony in law. You gotta listen to that. You went through this, now what you learn is that custom law in the bush. And then you explain it to them, but uh, what the spirits will tell you and all that, what they, to make them understand everything. So I just I just wanted to ask a couple of questions following that presentation. So you you mentioned that Bill is only one of the three remaining spe speakers of his language, right? Is that of his particular language yeah, group. Particular. So and I assume that there's some, um, you know. So but his group itself is still going strong, is my understanding from what we just saw. Yeah, they're still yeah, they're not dying out. The watermen um, got disbanded. My in the, their particular story, in there, this was cattle country, as you saw. Right. So he was his people were actually forced. They they needed that land. Otherwise, in other areas, they would just either push. If the white fellas wanted the land, they pushed them aside, massacred, whatever. Right. Right. If they needed the land, in this case, there was a whole area in that region where they could run the biggest cattle ranches in the world. What happens to an Aborigine person, um, you know, even before the, the white people came there, what would happen if an Aborigine person, for whatever reason, was displaced from their land? I mean, could they and had to relocate? I mean, would that be possible for them? Or would that be something that is completely um, impossible for an Aborigine person uh, to be suddenly evacuated from their homeland, from their territory? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people were displaced. There was a whole period. And so they, with their relationship system, they have relations everywhere all over, which is outside of bloodlines. And this was part of their survival over 50,000 years. And this was part of their legal system as well. So they could easily be, as Bill says, we got a bed everywhere. Right across the country, Aboriginal people will, when they meet, they'll decide whether you're brother, sister, uncle, auntie, mother. It could be a, um, I could meet a three-year-old girl or Bill could meet a three-year-old girl and that could be his mother. And they have this relationship system that goes outside of time, normal time. So the past so different realities almost. It's the it's it was a it was a survival mechanism, um, and it it was also to stop inbreeding, and mm -hmm. it was also peacemaking, and it was also yeah it was really they they were linked across boundaries so it, it taught again it taught respect for boundaries of your neighbors because you were linked in these relationship systems and on the boundaries you came together and you did ceremonies together and you brought your young ones in for initiations like high school certificates at the same time they're they're picking out their prospective partners and it's all to do with this relationship system so you've got a whole group of people but it's within a group that you could choose from and it was really serious law and the scientists have analyzed it and said it really does stop inbreeding. So if, let me see if I get this correctly. So besides the kind of uh, the actual relationship system, as in like kind of kinship ties, whether they were genetic or, you know, adopted or otherwise, besides the mythological kinship system, there, there was also tra trans time and space kind of a relationship system to where you may have a relationship with somebody who may be some, something else to you outside of this present reality. Is, am I, did I understand that correctly? When you said that Bill might meet the little Bill who is his mother, I'm just, I wanted to make sure that I understood that right. So we'll go to the uh, law chapter. So this is the law, and this was brought again in the dream time. Mm -hmm. 
So you go to skin relations here, right here. This was their relationship system. So everybody's born into a category. I got you. Here. That links and it shows you who you can marry. These are the marriage systems. But here, I'm Janama and Bill is Jungari. So they wear father and son. So I see. And I'm not born. So when you, if you, Julie, you spent time in the in the Aboriginal group, they would give you a skin name. They call it a skin name because you got to. They want to know how to relate to you. You right. Everybody has a relationship from outside, and we're, we're obviously not blood. Right. So this, this goes outside of time, so it's almost like the. They say there's a saying. They say the past, the present, and the future are all happening at the same time. So, in the Aboriginal system of thinking. And this is really difficult concepts for Westerners. So question is, is this in any way correlated to the totemic system or is that a whole separate uh, system of coordinates? It's connected, but it's different. Different, different again. Yeah. So you've got totems that then again uh, is connected in here, but the totems then link you to your land. So if you're a kangaroo person or a grasshopper person or a crocodile person that links you to it. It's almost like a ranch brand that right. links you with a whole bunch of other grasshopper people to care for a very specific piece of land. And that again was survival. So let me see if I got this right. So for example, I could be a member of the Jana, Janama group, right? But I also could be um, a grasshopper and I could at the same time be a member of a specific language group and a specific population. But I could also be a Janama person and have be maybe a kangaroo uh, totem and a member of a different group. Is that correct? Yep. So these you are can, categories can, that are overlapping completely on top of the tribe, no, not tribal, but like popul language. population, a language. And so th these are, this is a whole different set of categories, correct? Yeah. So you've got, the, the, this, is, this is within the watermen. So their neighbors, the youngmen, would have a, a very similar system because they're pretty close by. And so you would, they might change some of these names, but the system would be the same. I got you. So, and so these relationships would be symbolic in a way, but re very real, of course, to the people who exist within the system. Of yeah. mm -hmm. So the, the, the female names are the N's and the male names are the, the J's. So if you wanted to uh, search for a partner, you could go at those like festivals on the boundaries. You would have, if you're Nawala, you could marry, there might be 20 genomas you could choose from. Right. And, and they would go across boundaries. So that expanded the gene pool as well. Because so they knew that the groups would be, um, I think they understood conflict. Right. And so when conflict did occur, there were very uh, specific uh, mechanisms that actually kept it down. You dealt with the conflict, but you didn't go to commit genocide. Right. Was, from what we know is there was no genocide practiced. So uh, who would, uh, in the case of a marriage, how would that work? I mean, I, I, I know that I've read quite a bit of research and so forth on that, but that's one thing to read you know, dry research. It's another thing to ask somebody who's involved with the, with the life culture. I mean, would it be uh, the wife or the husband who would move or would it be either depending on the situation? Uh, other, who would move to, 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 to other person's land? Would it be the, the female or the male? I think, I think it varies. Uh, it can be patrilineal or matrilineal. It depends on the landscape. Often in, in you're in um, certain landscapes, it's more feminine. And other land, like the desert, would be more masculine. And who would the grandparents, like the elderly grandparents, how, did, how were they cared for? How did, were they incorporated into this? Oh, the grandparents are so important. This is where um, they were important for the story. And they worked, they have the... And we know grandparents have a special relationship with the young ones. And so uh, while the other ones are off hunting, it's the, it's the grandparents making sure the stories are told true. And this is how you have Bill's career. And this is a good time to, to share the first part of Bill's creation story, which is a story about a flood that we know happened 7,000 years ago. How did that story stay true for 7,000 years? Academia has dismissed these stories for so long because they've always said stories change after two or 300 years. But it was kept true because it was almost like a peer review. You had your grandparents working with you, real little kids. And that was a cultural mechanism that 
ensure this again the survival of the culture so i can i go to that one next uh, yeah, of course. And while while we're going to that one, I was just going to ask you another question about you mentioned the little ones, the children, that the Australian yeah. Aborigines. Um, I know a lot of culture have a concept where, for example, a small child is given um, either a mock name or a bad name. Uh, in other words, in some cultures, sometimes children before a certain age are not viewed as people, or on the other hand, are especially protected and uh, they're given mock names to keep the evil spirits away from them. Is there anything like that in the Aborigine culture? What's their perception of really small children? Uh, I think the children are sacred. I think in, in, in the Aboriginal creation story, everything that in creation is, is essentially good. Okay. There is original sin does not exist in the indigenous. Right. And the children are, they're human, they're capable of being bad, but they're not born bad. Right. And right. that, that includes the plants, the birds, the animals, everything is honored. And that's why you care for it. And it's all your relatives. What American Indians say is your relatives. And that goes back to that creation story. We're all made from the same thing. Aboriginal people don't say relatives. They just, but it's incorporated in there. Yeah. If you go out to the culture and, and you go out to visit Bill, he'll take you to a rock art site. He'll sit in front of it. There's the blackboard. He'll say, this is my book. This is older than your books, Paul, and you have your university and you have your professors. I'm a Bush professor. And he said, these are our books and these are older than your books. And he's dead right. These, these are dated conservatively at seven to 10,000 years old, which is about when the flood came. And in rock art in Australia, there's places where they go up to about 30,000. So we're talking about some of the oldest rock art in the world because the story is where it all began, the creation story, and I've broken it into three parts. Mm -hmm. And he, again, Bill's neighbors will have their creation story, it will link to their land and their, because their animals and their rock formations and their landscape is different. So they'll have a unique uh, story that is uniquely different, but the essence of the dreaming, the dream time is still the same. Tell you the story about our creation history. Now, before that, what happened in this country? There was no rocks. And there was no tree, grass, pencil. And the, uh, the first of the three people was in this country. Now, uh, the one is all rainbow. The one that made the sea. An old lady called Dum Dum come out of the side of the earth, is a frog lady, and went across and made it up with one rainbow. Two in our rainbow and the kingdom set together. Anyway, uh, later, they got married up and they had many children all underwater. The later, Dundu walked out inland to dry herself out. Another one came down from the sky, it's called Nade. It's a long Mimi man. Came down and landed beside a tundum. And he said to Nare, where'd you come from? Nare said, oh, I came from the top. And, they, uh, and uh, Nare asked the tundum, where'd you come from? And she said, I come out of the side of the earth. Ah, oh. anyway, they sat down and they had a talk and they got made it up. And then I don't do finish up with the two husbands. He had all rainbow and he had Nadi. Twin and Nadi and the Dundu, they had many children. He's part of the old lightning people. Lightning is the one who struck the land in this country. They put all the songs together. They named it all the different plants. They named it all the different soil, the earth and everything that they invented all the different tools. They would rock and everything. They made a big creation song with the story right across the country, all around, with the lightning people. While they were there together, and they're making all these songs and made a lot of noise, and all rainbow can hear. And he woke up and stood up and he looked inland. There's many people walking around. And all rainbow walked across and kept all jungle. Why you do this, having everybody out here in the dry land, we should have everybody together all underwater. 
Now, boom, boom, check now. We gotta have two separate lots. One lot in the water and one lot inland. And Rainbow said, no, we're going to have everybody all under water. And Rainbow goes back and he sang a great big spiritual song. He sang it and made the water rise. And water come right over in this country and flooded our world. This country was in big flood. We call that the Ngabal Ngabal was here. The song with the Ngabal Ngabal also in the creation song, we still use that song today. Never threw any the creation song away. We still teach them as young. When the flood was rising, all these little lightning people moved from the low country and went up and based on the top of that high mount. And now they come down from the sky, helping all these children. Walking across the water, he was a very huge, tall man. That's what they call him a meme. Picking up all these children. Water was only up to his waist deep. And the water was rising. And putting all these little lightning people on top of the high mount. And everybody was watching. And looking at the water rising. And all of them, there was no bird in this country. All lightning people. One of them is not today, it's a bird. So he came from the lightning people to pick up a little bird now. Huh? It's called Willy Waiter. Willy Waiter, the one he invented for the stone tool, made spear points, stone axes, graver, and everything out of the mud. And he sang it, it all went hard. And he made a pointy one. He said, This is my ideal to speed our rainbow, get rid of the water. We don't want to get drowned. And a uh, Willy Waiter raced across and said to the old light, he said, Maybe the way we can go, speed the rainbow. Right, and reckon, good idea to get rid of the old rainbow. Anyway, um, and the lightning said, All right, give us that spear. Wait a minute, the Willie Whitetail said, I'll go down and make the long end of the spear. Né? He tracked all the mud and he rubbed it together, made it longer, and he sang it, made it like a long spear, and put these little flints on the end of it out of a mud again, and it was very strong. But he made many of them. And he went across and gave it to the lightning. Lightning, the one threw the spear, hit the old rainbow, cut him in a half, never killed him. And old rainbow got very annoyed. And he sang it and he brought his water right up. And they, the, the lightning said, Oh, keep that spear to the gray falcon. Now he was a human person, he's a bird today. Now the falcon, so once he carried the fire, um, he carries a, what we call jundi, it's a boning tool. And he carries it and then flies him across with this, uh, with like the feathers and stuff like this. And we'll show the shooting star. With the falcon, he invented all that song. And he picked up his spear point and he sang it. And he sang it to go straight to the old rainbows, to kill our rainbow. When he sang it, when after he finished, the gray falcon, the one, the truth is spear, come right across the country, straight to the rainbow, shot his head right off. The head of the rainbow fell down, and the tail end stayed away, and the water ran right back to the sea level, where the rainbow made up. The big whirlpool there, the big spiritual song, and that's where the whole water disappeared, and that's where it is there today. It's interesting that the, the rainbow is uh, in this story is associated with water more so than with land, or was the sky, correct? Yeah, yeah. It rainbows the link between the the sky and the earth, but it's also connected to the core. In a lot of the stories, he doesn't say it here, but it comes from the core of the earth, and that's where the the ocean, the water, and the oceans right. came from. And the scientists actually think that's where our water. Um, the, the thinking now is, is there's a mystery in the world about where actually water came from. They think it might have come from an asteroid, but they're thinking it came from the... Well, like I said, I'm going to put a link to the website at the bottom of this video so everybody who's watching can go and explore these videos themselves and watch them uh, at their leisure and in full format. Do you mind if I ask you a couple more questions? Actually, David wants to jump in. I just find it amazing how many correlations there are between like uh, particularly any other group of hunters and gatherers uh, particularly out west here uh, 
the stories of coyote, which are over many different groups, many different uh, language groups. Yeah. Uh, they're very, very similar. Yeah. Once you get into it, you find that there actually is more similarities than differences. So it's beautiful. It really is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's our shared humanity living on the same earth, different yeah. places, different climates, but you're under the same stars as well. So you, you find all these stories with the stars that are really similar. And it's just a tragedy that, you know, in Northern Europe, we probably had them at some point, you know? Yeah. 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 We, they're just kind of gone now. I think that the monotheistic religions have very much wiped out a lot of these um, um, similar stories in uh, other parts of the world. And it's not just Europe. I mean, I think, I think the concept of uh, right and wrong doesn't exist in no. Aboriginal thinking. It's all like everybody's got their story and it's respected. And there's a thing called respect you, that you hear a lot when you hear these elders speaking. And it comes from just respecting, uh, just listening to other people's stories and respecting your neighbor's story is it's it's, it's uniquely different and that's okay it's right. just it's a beautiful way to be and there's also not that exceptionalism of um humans is being i mean that's a very monotheistic kind of judeo-christian uh and, and you know obviously islam uh idea that humans are the center and Yes. No, no, there's no there's no transition in those uh, monotheistic religions, uh, modern ones, to where I think the, in more traditional cultures there's a lot more kinship and a lot more overlap between humans, the animals, and even inanimate things like minerals, rocks, mm. landscape, and so forth. Yeah, yeah. No, we're we're it's part of caring. I just clicked on the resources button here. Mm -hmm. When you go to the second page you'll see the the video and then you got a transcription here so right. you can study this word for word because in his language system it's really uh quite there's a lot of metaphors um, that, that's a question i have is about the language i i lived with a um a, a woman we would call in english we would call her a shaman of the guichin people in the northern yep. canada and alaska as well um she was a speaker so she spoke 16 different languages so she could speak to other peoples around her and she says the stories are in the language and translations don't really work very well so the right. stories are being lost as the languages are being lost right. um and because yeah. the, the translation does it work the same way in australia yeah no i think i think you're right there and i think bill being a master linguist uh has helped a lot and he he's able to actually give us a gateway as a westerner to understanding these stories and then if you went to the obviously these things work on many different levels and so um the metaphors and i've, I've translated a number of the songs uh right. and the metaphors in the songs work on these amazing levels it's really beautiful can I ask you a question about Bill's uh, language? Um, I know that different languages around the world and even uh, different Aboriginal languages work differently. For example, in, in a lot of our Indo-European languages, it's very set system where the, um, the noun uh, has the most uh, bearing and in some cultures it's more about uh, the, um, you know, the verb or some, some languages don't even have verbs as such or they don't have adjectives as such and so forth. Do you know how his language is structured as far as where where the accent goes and the second kind of a follow-up question on that i assume that with mm. such complex kinship system that there would be a lot of different words for various uh, you know steps of relationships with other people more so than in any western language yeah i think the noun often comes first and then you build the action so it's similar that. in that way and then the the there's no um male and female like he'll often talk in english about dung dung and he'll say he right in their language system they're all spirituals so, so there's no gender or, or sex per se yeah yeah it's really it's really uh something so often he he's so good that he he, he doesn't do it but a lot of it's really common with other aboriginal people they'll just say he for a she well my mom does that and she's russian so yeah yeah so, so everything yeah. everything's he Everything. That's one of the problems we English speakers have is because as, as a Christian theologian, um, you get a lot of people saying that God is male because that's what English forces you to do. It's not true. It's God has n neither male nor female, which it's is the Aboriginal it. understanding as well as well. But uh, it because of the, the structure of English, we're forced into thinking that way.
Right. I'll just show you another little resource here. You could then go into, here's another one from the Cosmos, Cosmos Journal about how the, the seas, enduring memories of ancient sea rise. And right. This is where they're doing the research here to show how these stories, what we were talking about before, how these stories have endured for thousands of years and been true. Goes back to that relationship with the, the, here they argue, with the grandparents and the children. How did you meet Bill? How did you, I mean, if you don't mind me asking that question, how did you guys develop this, uh, you know, kind of a close uh, working together relationship? I met Bill as, a, as I was a working social worker. Um, and so, um, and I was up in the northern, I grew up in Adelaide, but I went up, I flew up to Darwin and I, I worked as a 21 year old. And I was actually working uh, with a lot of mothers who had their children stolen right. by, the, by the welfare, mm -hmm. which, is another, which is another topic we could get into if we had time. Right. And Bill was protected, his sister was stolen, and Bill was protected from being stolen because he's of mixed heritage. And if any of you, the listeners know about the stolen generation, they actually thought that the full that the full uh, blood, as they called them in those days, the full Aboriginal uh, people were going to die off. And they thought these people are the lowest. My ancestors basically arrived and thought these were the lowest form of humanity on the whole right. planet. So when Bill was growing up on that cattle station, they were forced to work on these cattle stations. He was called monkey by my ancestors, right? Um, anyway, and they used to be the government, it was the police, then it was the welfare as instruments of the government used to come in and basically take children away. Right. And so Bill was taken away. And forci forcibly yeah. relocate them and try to bring them up. Is he neither yeah. part of either original community nor the part of the white community nor the part of any community. It's pretty much the yeah. stolen generations. Stolen generation. It ha happened all over the colonial world as we've, we're finding out right now. Canada, America, whatever. Uh, South Africa, you name it. And Bill, Bill's sister was taken away. Bill, they painted him up. His mother painted him up a full black color so uh -huh. he wouldn't be stolen. Did you see the question in the chat that just showed up? Um, uh, regards, yeah. So the question about do people identify themselves through cultural or through bloodlines? They uh, identify through culture. Culture. So, so bloodlines. So you have a lot of uh, Bill's relatives who identify as Aboriginal and they're uh, on that stolen generation side, uh, relatives of his sister, and they're whiter than me. Right. So, and that's okay. The communities know who's Aboriginal and not. And I, I assume it's not so much based on really your genetics as it is based on your, your participation in that reality, I guess. Yep, yep, your participation and your, and your personal identification with culture. So it's, it's basically, it's like a nationality in the sense that you, your nationality is determined exclusively by who you, I mean, who you decide you are. It's different than jurisdiction. It's, it's more of a self-identity -identif based on culture, upbringing and everything else, right? Yep, yep. Was, was that, did that answer all the questions? I think so. Does, did anybody else have any other questions you guys wanted to jump in? Uh, David has a uh, lots of questions, but we probably should really closely review the website before we, we bombard you with all these yes, others. Um, I do have a question. How, uh, how old was Bill when you met him? Just, I'm oh, just yeah, you, that was your question. How did we, so I, you know, and, and I, um, I heard that there was this man who was opening up his culture and actually taking people out to rock art. Now, you don't go out to rock art because they're ceremonial. If the ceremonies are still going, only the, the fully initiated can go out and see them. Right. And so the watermen got together as a collective. And I think because they had, um, the elders had witnessed the, it was a little bit like Red Cloud in the Lakota. He right. could see what was coming. And they knew that the culture was changing. And so they realized that they needed to document these, these sites to protect them. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a really difficult thing for ab Aboriginal, for Indigenous groups. Do you, by, by opening them up and you, you either can protect them, but you also can, they can be Both damaged. Them. Right. Because these are sacred sites. Right. Right. And there's, there's sacred sites and there's sacred sites and there's sacred, sacred sites and sacred, sacred, sacred sites as well. So clearly they're only showing us certain things. 
Right. And um, anyway, so he opened it up and, and I just went out and I connected with him. I went out and he started taking um, people and groups from all over the world. And he was just brilliant. That's, absolutely that's brilliant. fantastic. That's because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I mean, I have kind of one kind of a sorrow because I have, you know, we did a series of uh, shamanistic cultures in different uh, parts of the world. I mean, I had some information about, like, for example, Mongolian, you know, the, the, far, the Russian, North um, Siberian cultures. But uh, I have not been able to do an episode, for example, on the Native American shamanism because I don't feel comfortable doing it as an outsider. And I have not been able to. They, do don't, they won't feel comfortable talking to you. And they won't they talk to you. So I, but I, I can tell, tell you that from experience. Yeah, but that's also a loss, I think, because, uh, um, good, and that's why, why you know, I'm very grateful to people like Bill who are willing to share their story. Because if they don't share their story once they're gone, I mean, it may just disappear from the record of humanity. That's right. And he's very clear. He sees this as really important for the present day right. world for Westerners to understand. Right. This it's, it's invaluable. Well, thank you so very much for being willing to come on and share this experience and share this amazing uh, resource. I think this is a unique opportunity. Nathan, thank you so much for introducing us yeah. to Paul. This is just a great honor. Uh, and we've learned a lot because we've been talking about with the Aboriginal culture from an anthropological a kind of, um, I don't know, geographical, social aspect. We've talked about the absolute genocide that happened in Tasmania and the like you said, the, the, the way that the Westerners treated these people was, I, I have no words for that. And I don't think anybody in their right mind has any words for that horror. But um, the fact that we still do have people from traditional cultures in this world, that we do have this invaluable opportunity to know what and who we are. Because here's the thing, like you were talking about the sacred sites, but Christianity, whenever it came into anywhere, first thing that it did, it went to the sacred site and stuck a church on top of it. Okay. Always, always, always. And so we lost most of it in Europe. We lost most of it in, uh, you know, Middle East. We lost of it just about every, most of it just about everywhere. And so the fact that there are still places and there's still people who can explain to us the th meanings, the concepts, at least the worldviews behind these sacred rituals, these sacred um, sites, these sacred songs. Um, it's, it's just a, such a window into who people really are all over the place. David is jumping in I'll here. Just sit there. Okay. I think it's really important because we are in the next four or five generations, we're going to face changes that humanity's never really done before. And mm. the learning that we can get from groups like that, I think will be key. Absolutely. It is, no, it's time for the indigenous voice. And I'll, t I'll share with you something that um, Nerolda Jacobs who is a, an activist, an Aboriginal activist, went on national TV on a, a, in Australia uh, two weeks ago and it was shared with me. They, um, they went around, they, had these, they have these amazing panels that I don't see anything like it in this country. Anyway, they have people from the, from the left and the right, but they have artists and activists and everything. They get, and the audience asks questions, just like what we're doing now. Anyway, and they said, is there any, can you leave us with a word of hope? And she said, well, She's connected to her community and to her elders, right? And this is where the culture is still really right. alive. And she said, when the white ships arrived, our people, my ancestors knew that this was not good. Right. So they consciously sang the spirituals deep into the ground to protect them. And then she said, now those same ancestors are singing them up. They are waking them up and you better get ready for the awakening. And if you don't want to be part of it, get out of the way. How it would be a way of understanding what's happening with the planet right now. The spirituals yeah, are the, awakening. The Native American, uh, almost all of our cultures, for example, didn't believe in uh, private uh, ownership of the land, even the nobody Meso did that really. The Mesoamericans and stuff they did. The a clan could own the land. Uh, the land, you, or, the yeah, land, the land, the clan. clan, more like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely. that's a very different thing. And again, as we face these challenges, it might be a more valid approach. 
Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the only thing that I got to say to say that's a little bit less optimistic is, uh, I, you know, I, I have an anthropologist that I highly respect, uh, Stanislav Drobyshevsky, and he has done a presentation on, uh, you know, what's going to happen to humanity if there is a worldwide catastrophe and all this horrendous stuff that people are predicting with climate and so forth and war. Um, and he's, he's a very optimistic gentleman, but uh, he's, um, he, one thing that worries him is that the resources that this planet once used to have, the plenty, plentitude of you know, animals, plentitude of fish, plentitude of just ores and other things, they're more or less used up. I mean, we don't have the endless herds anymore. We don't have fish that are splashing in the ocean or in a river from one shore to the other. Uh, so what humans are gonna be eating, what they're gonna be making their tools out of is a big fat question, but hopefully, if humanity learns anything and uh, you know incorporates this experience of these Aborigine people and other peoples who are much more, much more experienced at living on this planet than our very new budding uh, modern society with its breaking down of kinship ties and everything else and any sense of uh, belonging to the environment around them, uh, then maybe humanity does have a stand, stand a chance to survive and maybe evolve into something better eventually. So I would like to maybe wrap this up on a more hopeful note and not necessarily a dismal catastrophe outlook. Mm -hmm. But again, thank you, everyone. It's awesome right. to see everybody. And we will reconvene on the 27th. I will send out a reminder. Paul, again, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Right, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. exist within every man's soul, every man's and we will soul. live forever, or as long as stories are told, stories are told. Stories we are the archetypes that exist within every man's soul.